Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Poets and the MFA. This is a virtual open house highlighting the Alma College Low Residency MFA in Creative Writing. Let me share my screen and we will get underway here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, I'm not sure if I did that properly. Let me go back and do that again, because I don't think I hit the share screen. There we go. All right, can everyone see that now? Yes, okay, thank you. Okay. The Alma College MFA in Creative Writing. I am your host for this evening. I am Sophronia Scott. I am the director of the program. I am a fiction and nonfiction writer, and I have an MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. I was lucky enough to be asked to direct this program when it was first uh, okayed, um, received its accreditation in 2020. And because the low residency model was so important for my life and my growth as a writer, I knew what it could be for people. So I was more than happy to come on board to help design this program and to bring the faculty together and to offer it to writers of the world. Oops. So the wonderful thing about our MFA is that we have a wonderful emphasis on place. It takes us to different places, both where we are here in Alma, Michigan, which is located in the center of the state, uh, just about an hour north of Lansing, but it also takes us abroad. And here you see photos um, from our recent residency in Venice. These are our graduates who uh, graduated during that residency. This evening, we're also going to have a sample lesson from one of our esteemed faculty, Leslie Contreras-Schwartz. Leslie is a multi-genre writer as well, a 2021 Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellow and the 2019-2021 Houston's Poet Laureate. She's the author of five collections of poetry, including The Body Cosmos, Black Dove Paloma Negra, um, which was a finalist for the 2020 Best Book of Poetry from the Texas Institute of Letters, Fuego, and Night Bloom and Ciote, which was a semi-finalist for the 2017 Tupelo Prize, sorry, Tupelo Press Dorset Prize, judged by Ilya Kaminsky. Her work has appeared in multiple publications, and she recently actually published a memoir, which was begun uh, during one of our residencies. But tonight she's going to talk about poetry and offer us a lesson. But before we do that, I will tell you a little bit more about our program. So the Alma College MFA is a two year program, low residency to fit a busy schedule. Now, what does that mean? It means that you don't have to move. You don't have to be going to school full time, which usually means that one has to leave a job in order to pursue a degree. Uh, no GRE is required. There's no application fee. You complete five 10-day residencies. So we have two residencies a year, one in the summer, one in the winter. And you um, attend these residencies, and they're pretty intensive. Lectures, readings, uh, lectures by both faculty and students. And you are also in workshop, getting your work critique and critiquing the work of your classmates. We offer studies in uh, in the genres of fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. At the end of each residency, sorry, during a residency, you will be paired one-on-one -on -one with your faculty advisor. During the rest of the residency, you will develop a study plan that you will carry out throughout the rest of the term. Now you collaborate on this study plan. It's not just the faculty person saying, well, you're gonna read this and you're going to do that. It's about understanding where you are with your writing, what it is that you'd like to learn, what it is that you need to learn, especially um, once they start looking at your writing. Uh, you collaborate on a reading list. And then you come up with a series of deadlines that you will execute every month 
uh, submitting about 25 to 35 pages of creative and critical work each month. Now, if you're doing that much writing every month uh, for two years, you can imagine you will uh, produce a lot. We say that this is about writing for the 21st century. This means having energetic discussions that will help you see your writing in the context of current issues and events. Um, we like to say your voice matters, which means that of course you will come to the program with your own projects and that you're interested in perhaps you know, writing memoir or writing poems related to your life. But you can also speak to what's going on in the world, that you have that power and that ability as well. Another hallmark that makes us different from other MFA programs is that we focus on professional development. We bring in people from the publishing industry so that you can learn uh, not only how to get work published, but where your writing fits in certain venues. Because not all writing, for example, is suited for a big five publishing house. So um, I've seen students come out of MFA programs trying to pursue that when their writing is in no way um, going to fit that commercial venue or they're pursuing agents when their writing will probably go to a press that does not require an agent. So it's about understanding the, the landscape so that you can make decisions that are best for your work. You will read and think critically as a writer. You will also develop a strong understanding of craft as well as the ability to lecture on technique. Our students are quite devoted to our program. Uh, this is a photo from the recent um, Association of Writers and Writing Programs uh, conference. It was in Kansas City. Now, we had not been at this conference before as an organization, but our students on their own submitted a proposal to do a panel about our MFA program, and it was accepted. So we showed up, and as it turned out, they were happy just to have us there because they wanted to be able to say, this is our program. This is where we go to school. And we were happy to be able to be there to back them up on that. And we will continue to do that. We're excited that our students are excited about us. Uh, and this is uh, the image from the panel. Uh, I mentioned uh, the residency. Our summer residencies are held at Alma College, and Alma is located, as I mentioned, right in the heart of Michigan. We have started rotating our winter residency in various locations. So we were just in Venice, Italy. This coming winter, we will be at Lake Junaluska in North Carolina, which is not far from Asheville. The following summer, uh, we're going to switch it up. Um, our summer 2026 residency will be in Oxford, England. And we will go from there. Um, we have this emphasis on place, right? To understand not just uh, writing in the world or writing nature, but, but truly understand the ground from which you write and how it influences you. Our students uh, really felt that hit home, you know, when we did the, the residency in Venice. Because it wasn't just about being in this different place, right? We have on our blog um, a, a piece by one of our students who talked about how it was just how things changed for them just living a different existence. So, for example, she said, you couldn't just take your food, you know, at a mealtime and take it to your room and eat it by yourself. Because in Italy, our meals were not only group events, um, presented to us in the most loving way by our host at the Hotel Villa Francesca, these meals lasted well over two hours. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time together, a lot of quality time, um, eating, laughing, and getting to know each other. And the students said that you tend to trust the people critiquing your work when you get to know them that well. So this is what can happen when, when you just put yourself in a different place. I also loved that the students uh, wrote extensively. Uh, there's a, uh, a residency journal that's actually created and um, the students work on uh, chronicling their experience of residency with each residency, not just the Venice residency, so that they can see for themselves how the um, experience is changing them. 
oh, here's another fantastic picture from one of our meals. As you can see, it was it was a pretty good time. Probably gained like 15 pounds. <laughs> uh, this is a photo from our lecture hall in Venice. Um, again, even though we were in a different place, we had visiting writers, we had our lectures, we were in workshops. We also um, had Janet Simmons. She is the travel expert who arranges our travel residencies. And she's not just a, someone who's handling logistics. She is someone with an Oxford degree in art history and also geography. So, and she's also an expert on Italy. So each day before our, our excursions, she would um, give like a mini lecture about you know, where we were going, um, the importance of the landscape, um, how it might be inspirational, what writers were connected to these areas. So it, it was really an in-depth experience. Um, I show this picture just to let people know uh, that we have students of all age ranges. I get that asked that question a lot. Students say, well, I'm not a traditional student. Well, the low residency format is specifically for non-traditional students. <laughs> not everyone went to Venice. So this is a photo from the students who did an alternative residency in Detroit. They rented an Airbnb. Uh, you see in the, the middle there with his head around the pole there, that's Jim Daniels. He was um, our um, poetry slash CNF faculty who ran the workshop and they had their own excursions. And uh, again, a marvelous experience. We dovetailed the schedules so that the students could participate in the lectures in Venice and vice versa via Zoom. Oh, I forgot to mention our students also chose to wear the, la the laurel wreaths that Italian graduates wear. So that was pretty cool too. Uh, Frank in Detroit graduated as well. So he was uh, virtually in the degree ceremony. You have um, a few different degree options. Uh, students usually come to an MFA wanting to study one genre. So we offer fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. It's a two-year program. But usually what happens, you know, because you're going to lectures in all three genres, students usually get bitten by the bug of, of another genre, maybe poetry or fiction or, or whatever it is that they thought that they didn't write. So we give them the option to try out um, studying in a, another genre for one term, or if they want to do a full-blown study to do two genres. So you do three terms in a major genre and two terms in your minor genre and submitting a creative thesis in both. And I think that is it for the moment. I will turn this over to Leslie, stop my share, so that we can start our lesson. Thank you, Sophronia. I'm so You're happy welcome. to be here, um, especially for National Poetry Month. I'm excited to talk about poems with you. So I'm going to share my screen. And today we're going to be talking about imagery. Um, I'm going to share with you three poems that I really feel express um, this idea of how imagery works in poetry and captures experience through the senses. So I'd like to start with a quote by Mark Doty, the poet Mark Doty. And what he says about you know, why do we write poetry? Why do we, or any genre, why do we write? What are we attempting to do with this work? And why does it usually entail sensory description? So his answer is, it's a desire, an immediate impulse in the face of wonder or pleasure or feeling confounded or flummoxed, a need that flares up as if it were my work in the world to do exactly this, to find accurate words or more ambitiously terms commensurate with the clamoring world. So it really captures you know, our viewpoint, the sing singularity of our experiences. Um, and if we have a fictional character or a speaker in our poem, um, we're sharing experience through the lens of that speaker. Um, he continues, perception is simultaneous and layered. And to single out any aspect of it for naming 
is to turn your attention away from myriad other things, that continuous, complex response to things perpetually delivered by the senses, the encompassing sphere of our sub subjectivity. So I'd like to look, uh, take a look at Diane Seuss's I Have Lived My Whole Life in a Painting Called Paradise. So I'm gonna share this poem on my screen. Hold on one second, I'm trying to get a better view for myself so I can read from it. I have lived my whole life in a painting called Paradise, with the milkweed splitting at the seams, emancipating their seeds that were once packed in their pods like the wings and hollow bones of a damp bird held too tightly in a green hand, and the giant jade moths stuck to the screen door as if glued there, and the gold fields and stone silos and the fugitive cows none for escaping their borders. I have lived in a painting called Paradise, and even the bad parts were beautiful. There were fields of needles arranged into flowers, their sharp ends meeting at the center. And from a distance, the fields full of needle flowers look blue from their silver reflecting the sky, or white as lilies if the day is overcast. And there in the distance is a meadow filled with the fluttering skirts of opium poppies. On the hillside is Moon Cemetery, where the tombstones are hobnailed or prismed like cut glass bowls. And some are shaped so precisely like the trunks of trees that birds build their nests in the crooks of their granite limbs. And some of the graves are shaped like childside tables with stone tablecloths and teacups, yes. I have lived in a painting called Paradise. The hollyhocks loom like grandfathers with red pocket watches. And off in the distance, the water is ink and the ships are white paper with scribblings of poems and musical notations on their sides. There are rabbits, mink colored ones and rabbits that are mystics humped like haystacks. And at Moon Cemetery, it's an everyday event to see the dead rise from their graves as glittering as they were in life. To once more pick up the plow or the pin or the ax or the spoon or the brush or the bowl. For it is a cemetery named after a moon and moons never stay put. There are bees in the air flying off to build honeycombs with pollen heavy on their back legs. And in the air, birds of every ilk the gray kind that feed from the ground and the ones that scream to announce themselves and the ravens who feed on the rabbits until their black feathers are edged in gold. And in the air also are little gods and devils trying out their wings, some flying, some failing, and making a little cream-colored blip in the sea. Yes, all of my life I have lived in a painting called Paradise with its frame, of black varnish and gold leaf. And I am told some girls slide their fingers over the frame and feel the air outside of it. And some even climb over the edge and plummet into whatever is beyond it. Sorry, Alexa off. I'm so sorry. I'm told some girls slide their fingers over the frame and feel the air outside of it and some even climb over the edge and plummet into whatever is beyond it. Some say it is hell, and some say just another boulder paradise, and some say a dark wilderness, and some say an unswept museum or library floor, and some say a long lost love waits there wearing bloody riding clothes, returned from war, and some say freedom, which is a word that tastes strange, like a green plum. So I shared this poem because there, there's such a rich gathering in this poem of imagery. And specifically for Diane Seuss, her style is to 
bring together all these disparate images and descriptions. And what we get insight into is an interior, interior landscape. She uses um, descriptions of the natural world. So we have milkweeds splitting at the seams, emancipating their seeds. And as she builds up, we get more elements of the of nature and of the landscape. But there's a turn in the poem where she starts um, using more ominous, morbid images. And that's where the speaker reveals herself in the poem more freely. I have lived in a painting called Paradise and even the bad parts were beautiful. So we're getting her singular perspective, her point of view. Yes, there's this landscape, we're looking at it. It can be a realistic landscape, but also it speaks on another, a deeper level, a metaphoric level. So there are fields of needles arranged into flowers, there's sharp ends meeting at the center. Um, and she goes on and slowly it starts to, the tone changes on the hillside in Moon Cemetery where the tombstones are hobnailed or prism. But she's putting, she's holding up these images that are both morbid and beautiful and putting them side by side, something that she does quite frequently in her poetry, um, or she it shares experiences, uh, painful experiences, but puts them side by side with images of beauty and of human uh, strength and bravery. Um, but this poem in particular is different than what you might find in say a narrative poem because it works associatively. So one image there, everything's juxtaposed um, together in this one poem that may not readily appear to be have a relationship, but she builds one and creates this very rich uh, layer of, um, of art, like a painting itself. Any, any comments on that poem, if you've heard it, if it's brand new to you? Mary, did you want to say something on unmute? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've never heard it before, but it I liked it at the different contrast and the descriptions and everything. Thank you for sharing it. Sure. I'm happy to. I love Danny and Sue's. And now I'm going to share a very different poem by Elizabeth Bishop. Or there's more of a clear narrative. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, so yes, this is uh, yes. less associative, less built on disparate images and has more of a, a linear narrative of a speaker exp having an experience. Um, but the use of imagery is very rich in this poem. And it begins out, very plain spoken and direct about what's happening. But then the fish that's being described is personified. It takes on deeper meaning and, and I'll read it before talking about it. The fish. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat, half out of water with my hook fast in the corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there, his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper. And its patterns of darker brown was like wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice. And underneath, underneath two or three rags of green weed hung down, while his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, 
the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tin foil, seen through the lenses of old scratch ice and glass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw. And then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like, hung five old pieces, pieces of fish line, or four in a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines in a fine black thread, still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away, like metals with their ribbons frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared and victory filled up the little rented boat from, from the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange, the sun cracked thwarts, the oar locks on their strings, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow and I let the fish go. So very different poem than the one we saw by Diane Seuss. Um, and here we have a clear narrative, like I, I said before, um, and we start out with a very simple image. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat, half out of water with my hook fast in the corner of his mouth. Direct, um, plain spoken, he, ha he didn't fight, he hadn't fought at all. And then the speaker becomes more introspective, reflective, and starts looking more closely at the fish and notices what to her stand out as peculiar, um, the brown skin like wallpaper, um, shapes like full-blown roses. And then it's, it's almost a little bit disgusting but beautiful at the same time he was speckled with barnacles fine rosettes of lime infested with tiny white sea lice so we have all these vivid descriptions and we're, as a reader we're able to visualize through this these sensory details these concrete details um we can experience what the speaker experienced alongside her through this poem and then as the poem progresses, um, it, it, we're, we're going on a journey past the physical fish into something metaphoric, where his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers. So she starts talking about the intricacies of the, the fish's body. Um, and then we get to this section where she starts to personify the fish, grim, wet, and weapon-like. Um, with his, He seems to be depicted as like a, a weathered old man who has survived uh, so much tri trials. Um, and so by the end of the poem, she lets the fish go. But it's not simply a narrative about releasing a fish. She sees something that she identifies in the fish's, in all the details of the fish. Um, so this is a great poem that has, again, so much rich imagery. Um, any comments, anybody familiar with this poem? Any fishers? Yes, yeah, so I'm a fisher. I'm not familiar with the poem. I I, I found the uh, ending kind of uh, ambiguous. It was dark and disturbing, but also 
this rainbow of hope for this fish that's being released. Um, occasionally, when you catch fish, you do see some scars from some other likely uh, similar um, fishing tails, but um, it's the first time I've heard something that detailed and, and that disturbing of a fish that's still uh, remarkably alive. Right. It is a disturbing poem, but also, I would say, beautiful, um, dark and beautiful in the same way that the Seuss poem is, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to write that way, so maybe that's why I picked these poems. <laughs> um, I am going to share another poem by Sylvia Plath, um, which similarly has a, a, a bit of a narrative um, but uses Im rich imagery and description to describe an emotional reality. Um, through concrete details, she describes a setting, but we're also, also getting access to an emotional reality. Blackberrying. Nobody in the lane and nothing, nothing but blackberries. Blackberries on either side though on the right mainly, a blackberry alley going down in hooks and a sea somewhere at the end of it heaving. Blackberries big as the ball of my thumb and dumb as eyes, ebon in the hedges, fat with blue-red juices. These they squander on my fingers. I had not asked for such a blood sisterhood. They must love me. They accommodate themselves to my milk bottle, flattening their sides. Overhead go the cuffs in black cacophonous flocks, bits of burnt paper wheeling in a blown sky. Theirs is the only voice protesting, protesting. I do not think the sea will appear at all. The high green meadows are glowing as if lit from within. I come to one bush of berries so ripe it is a bush of flies hanging their blue-green bellies and their wing panes in a Chinese screen. The honey feast of the berries have stunned them. They believe in heaven. One more hook in the berries and bushes end. The only thing to come now is the sea. From between the two from between two hills, a sudden wind funnels at me, slapping its phantom laundry in my face. These hills are too green and sweet to have tasted salt. I follow the sheep path between them. A last hook brings me to the hill's northern face, and the face is orange rock that looks out on nothing, nothing but a great space of white and pewter lights, in a din like silversmiths, beating and beating at an intractable metal. So, in a similar fashion, the poem starts with, with the physical journey. Here's a woman um, gathering blackberries and walking toward the sea. But as the descriptions become more complicated and the diction she uses, it, there's a tonal shift from just observation to something troubling and disturbing. Something is happening to her at this moment she she's seeking out the sea as some type for some type of solace but she finds the reverse um nobody in the lane and nothing but blackberries blackberries on either side so we so we get a visual idea of what she sees in this experience a blackberry alley going down in hooks and a sea somewhere at the end of it heaving we can hear what she experiences blackberries big as the ball of my thumb we know what they look like to her dumb as eyes ebon in the hedges fat with red blue red juices so we see not just an experience of someone gathering blackberries but through this specific speaker's eyes and we get an idea of the emotional journey that she's taking right at this moment so it really when we write our own work and, and shape our own poems and stories or prose. Um, imagery is a, a building block that you use 
to create this world for other people that let them into your experience. It reenacts what we experienced for other people. Um, so I will open it up to questions or comments about the poems, if you had any um, thoughts while, while I was reading them, or I, I know some of you got a chance to look at them beforehand. Any thoughts or comments? Um, Leslie, I have a question about what happens to her when she finally does reach the ocean is is this totally a reaction to the wind of of you know being pressed back or you know what, what do you see is happening to her in that last part um let me pull it up again because it starts off with her saying nobody in the lane nothing nothing but blackberries so she can mm -hmm. she can't see beyond this path full of blackberries. Mm -hmm. And as she goes on, she's seeing how grotesque some of uh, the the natural world around her is so rich and ripe. Um, mm -hmm. bush of flies hanging their blue green bellies. Everything has just is just overflowing. The honey feast mm -hmm. of the berries have stunned them. The only thing to come now is the sea. So she's been seeking the sea, but had to go through this path. Mm -hmm. um, she A sudden wind funnels at me, slapping its phantom laundry in my face. So there's a turn. You're right, Saferni. There is a, um, a noticeable turn. And then she looks at the landscape, and it seems too green and sweet to have tasted salt. It looks unnatural to her. Something is wrong, something. So we're starting to get access to her uh, more emotional information about the speaker's experience. Um, mm -hmm. Here she is, has, have, she's gone through this path. She's reached the sea and she's met with this din like silversmiths. This ter it's a terrifying ending really. Um, mm -hmm. But even without knowing Sylvia Plath's life story, you can you can guess um, that at this point in her life, um, she was experiencing extreme difficulty um, in her marriage and in her professional life, um, and really struggling with depression. But she's able to do that through concrete imagery and details. Um, that kind of paint a picture of an experience. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to follow that up with a, a question. When just in general, when you're teaching poetry as a poet and educator, um, do you tend to welcome going into um, the woods a little bit on deconstructing who the poet is? Like, there's so much we do know about uh, Sylvia Plath right. compared to a lot of poets. And do you find that a distraction or a welcome interpretation? I think it depends on um, what craft element I'm talking about. Um, because I I do tend to focus on what's there on the page. Um, just because that's what we're offering to other people as writers. It's just, we they don't have our life story or they only have access to what we give them. Um, it's curated by us. But if I'm talking specifically about something autobiographical that's pertinent to what I'm to the craft lesson, I will bring it up. Um, it really depends. Any other comments that's, or questions? I was going to say that's an interesting question, Bill, because I I was. I, I was thinking about the fact that it that it's from a posthumous collection, right? So that that did have me thinking about wow, when when did she write this, and was it one of her later, you know, final yeah. poems? And so, it, and I, I found I can't help but think about that, right, in the context of because it's, it's Sylvia Plath. Yeah, and she's such a complicated biography. Um, yeah, that made it even more fascinating for me knowing a little bit about that. Yeah. 
Did you uh, ever read the birthday le letters? I read uh, the bell Ted. jar, but yeah, I, I, I've only read some of her works with Ted. Well, no, husband. the birthday letters is by her husband, Ted Hughes. Right, Ted Hughes, right. Right. Yeah, I've read and some of that, yeah. So I there's guess he had um, some, a, some guilt there. Well, but there's a poem that, that still haunts me to this day that um, I read from that collection. That's um, basically a description of, of meeting her for the first time and, and their early relationship. And he talks about seeing her and, and describing her physically and, and this, um, this spark of personality. And it said, there's a line that said something like, it was as though I saw you once and never again. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me in the more I've learned since then, you know, I think it's been like 30 years since I read that, that that can be what it is when you are in relationship with someone who is mentally ill, that, that, you know, you may have even met them when they were on like the, the higher side of, of whatever they've done, you know, um, what they go through. And then that person is not there anymore, or at least that aspect of them isn't. So I, you know, I find poems can be haunting, especially when you get an image or a line like that, that is so clear and so true that it can stay with you for so long. And it's interesting that you bring that poem up, Sophronia, because po poems or works of uh, different pieces of writing can have conversations with each other if you put them up side by side. Um, but these kind of discussions are what happens at the residency. Um, mm. And I know even as a faculty member, I'm inspired by um, other faculty members, lectures, um, readings. Um, it's just a very rich experience um, to be with people who care so deeply about writing as as we do. So, um, Leslie, what did what did you get out of the MFA experience for your poetry? So I went in knowing that I, I was dedicating myself to writing poetry. Um, I had worked as a journalist and technical writer, but I knew that I really wanted to publish books. I wanted to, to work on craft. So my time there was spent forming community and really delving into all the nuts and bolts of what makes good writing. Um, and that meant a lot of reading, um, being exposed to writers that I'd never heard of, um, which continues to this day. I feel like I'm always learning and it started with the MFA. I learned how to edit my own work. I learned how to um, have a critical eye um, about my own work and other pe my peers um, and just built a new vocabulary. Like you, you don't know how to have a conversation about poetry until you learn all the different craft elements and how they apply to different situations. Um, so really it, it helped deepen my practice as a writer. Yeah, I think it helps to, to learn what's possible. Yes. Right? It takes you beyond what, what you would have created on your own. For sure. So, and it sounds like you and I had a similar experience in that, um, we started off in, in one genre, but came away like writing in multiple genres, just like you, right. you now writing um, nonfiction and fiction. You're working on some fiction as well, I right? I am. I'm, I'm working on some kind of surreal slash historical. And it's all, all these different type of genres blended together. But I guess that's a, a, tr a trend right now is genre blending. Does anyone have any questions for Leslie, either about the lesson or, or I can take lessons, I'm sorry, I can take questions as well about the residencies, about the program. Hi, hi I have a question. Yes, Mary. Oh, um, anyway, 
Uh, look, I'll give you about a minute about me. Okay, growing, I'm 62 now. So growing up, I was never a reader. I was always outside playing in the dirt. And I was a flight attendant, so I flew. And then I discovered uh, Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, Morning Pages. And when I was writing in the morning about, uh, let me see when it started, a few years ago, poetry was coming out. So I'm more of like, a, I do automatic writing, which is beautiful poetry. So it's automatically comes out of my heart. It comes from a higher place. And if I was in the residency, um, I because I read about love and, and I'm kind of like mystical in that way. So mm -hmm. would the MFA program fit my type of uh, writings or I what I'm writing? I think so, because you're you're starting from a point of inspiration um in what yeah you know, i used to write that way too and i still probably do when i first start drafting um but i think what i learned through the mfa program is that it was important to me to have readers um and so i i learned how to take what was deeply intimate to me and open it out to more, so that it could be understood by more people so that oh. I was making a connection with others um, that way. I don't think you have to change your style or, you know, how you're inspired. Um, I think like Sophronia said, it's about possibility. You'll just grow. Yeah. It's like, You'll, you'll have that inspiration and you'll create that first poem. But then it's like, okay, what is this poem about? And what can I do to bring out even more of what this poem is meant to be, right? You can learn to, to work with it, right? Um, and, and it may be that, that it's just going to be very similar to what you initially started with, but then it, it will be a conscious choice that you've left it that way, right? But um, but you will learn about the the choices, the the rhythms, the structures. You will read other things that may be similar to yours, right? That were written in the same way, and to see what that writer did with it. But it's it's about the, the way I like to put it, Mary. It's like um, someone once told me that that I was like Harry Potter, right? That I have to respect my magic, right? But you have a wand, and you can like you know flop it around like that and make stuff happen. But the most powerful wizards can wield that magic with intention, oh. right? So it's about understanding your craft so that you can wield it with intention. You know, both what comes inspirationally, but then what do you do with it after, right? Right. Oh, okay. Well, well, thank you. And this, this needlepoint picture I have behind me is hanging in my office. I bought oh, it. I was wondering what that is. I you bought it, it where? In an antique store about 10 years ago here in Colorado. And it's oh. in my office. So I put it on my Zoom. But I actually oh, have this up okay. in my office. So this, I bought this like 10 years ago. Isn't that cool? I love She's, it. It looks like it's like a mural that's behind you. Like it's I love it. That's great. Okay. Thank you. That's awesome. You're welcome, Mary. Any other questions before we wrap it up for this evening? No? Okay. Yes. Oh, yes, Chetna. Yeah. Sorry. I'm so. Moment. My family members are talking. Give me. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to write it in chat, Chetna? Yes, I can write it. Oh. Because that would be fine too. I know it's not always easy to have a, it's not always possible to have a quiet environment. So I'm actually, <clears throat> I'm actually in somebody else's house today because I'm in uh, Grand Rapids for the Festival of Faith and Writing. Uh, Chetna is asking, is it hard being a poet, Leslie? <laughs> um, hold on one second, I lost my screen. Um, do you mean specifically as a writer or to make a living um i was talking or, about inspiration 
um, you know, struggling with writer's block and the low pay that some writers are getting these days. So I was just Oh, wondering. yes. Thank you. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of writers make money through teaching um, or they might go into other fields like publishing, um, but continue working on their craft. Um, so I'm always finding, no matter what job I've had, I've found a way to keep writing. Um, as a poet, it is quite different than, uh, for example, fiction writers, because we don't get advances. We don't make as much money on our books as fiction writers. Um, but it it really becomes about making connections and community, and that develops over time. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, I don't know if you received the... Um the April newsletter that um, I sent out via email, I think it went out last week, but it featured one of our recent graduates. Actually, he was one of those guys in the, the picture graduating at Venice, um, Joshua Zeitler, and he's a poet. And when Leslie just mentioned about being in community, I, you know, I immediately thought of him again, because even though he's, he's seeking to teach, right? Because he wants to, to um, support himself as a writer and as an artist, um, the things that Joshua does are about being in community. So he sends his work out for publication, and but he also does uh, readings. He's reading at um, area bookstores, at you know libraries. There's a lot of activities going on for National Poetry Month. So he's doing readings at local libraries that are opening up spaces for poets to read. He also just finished um, what I would call a heart project, heart, H-E-A-R-T, um, he had a, a dear friend who actually used to be a um, a, um, a, a maintenance worker, um, one of the, the janitors at Alma College, um, a woman who worked there for many, many years, who um, was diagnosed with cancer, and it was terminal cancer, and Joshua, and she was a poet, like he knew that she wrote, um, but she never got to study it, never got to, to really, you know, focus on it in the way that she wanted to, and he helped her in her final days to assemble her work and to publish, um, to self-publish a, a book of her work. Um, he did one version of it right before she died and she passed away, I think about two months ago now. And he's about to have um, host a reading from that book. So I think it's important to ask yourself who you want to be in the world as a poet and what do you need to do to, to make that happen? It means different things for different people. So um, I, I think when you make those choices, or, you know, make those decisions, it's easier to choose the path that's going to get you there. Thank you, it was so insightful, thank you. No, you're welcome, Chetna. And um, Chetna, I don't know, I can't remember if you had already signed up for one, but you know, if you have any other questions, you, know, you can sign up for an individual Zoom session with me. Um, I think the next session is coming up next week. And, um, and I can answer more of your questions because maybe there's something you haven't thought of just yet. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Leslie, for this thank wonderful you. lesson on imagery. I'm excited to see you again at residency coming up in June. I am Sophronia Scott, she's Leslie Contreras-Schwartz, and we are with the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing. If you'd like to know about more about the program, our website is alma.edu slash MFA. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good. Thank you.